This is Blood 13 of the Rooster Teeth website. Your host for the mostest, the pervy panty power pony princess, the badass bitch. And I'm here for episode zero, which is the rundown episode, i.e. the explanation episode, for my upcoming Pokemon Fire Red Randomized Nuzlocke Challenge. Now, here's a basic premise of what that means. I'm going to be playing Pokemon Fire Red, and I'm going to be playing it under a set of self-imposed rules that make it much harder than normal, and on top of that, I'm going to be running the randomized aspect, which, well, you'll see in a minute. So, for those who don't know what a Nuzlocke run is, well, you're in luck, because I'm going to explain it right now. So here's what I've done, though, is, um, there's variations of the Nuzlocke challenge, or the Nuzlocke run, as it's sometimes called, or just, you know, Nuzlocke, doesn't matter. There are variations on it, there's different versions, there's, uh, personal tweaks. So I've composed my own personal set of rules. There are, of course, 13 of them, because, you know, it's me, it's Blood 13. So, let's just jump into it. Rule number one. Any Pokémon that faints, be it in battle, or outside of battle, and be it by an opponent, or an ally, or the player Pokémon's own actions or attack, the Pokémon is to be considered dead, and must be placed immediately in a special PC box marked Graveyard, and never used again under any circumstances. Pretty self-explanatory! This is the primary rule to a Nuzlocke run. When a Pokémon faints, it's gone, it's dead, you can never use it again. Normally, you would release the Pokémon, that way you're guaranteed not to use it again. I like having archives of things, and records of things, because I'm just OCD that way. So, there's just gonna be... I'm gonna say multiple PC boxes, because I know I am not skilled enough to choose just one. There's gonna be PC boxes marked Graveyard, where I'm going to store the dead Pokémon. That way I can go look at them, you know, it's like a graveyard, exactly what the fuck it sounds like. So, it's the same principle, though, as releasing them. You're never using them again. I guess, technically, on an emotional scale, releasing them is more of an impact, because, you know, they're gone. You literally cannot get to them. If they're in the PC box, you can go look at them, like I said. But, really, it's the same thing, because you still can't use them. It's the same emotional impact, as far as I'm concerned. Rule number two. The player may only catch the first Pokémon they encounter within each area. An area being defined by root number, cave slash dungeon name, etc. Different room slash screens of one area do not count as new areas. If said first encounter Pokémon faints, then there are no second chances, and the player must write the area off and move on. In the event of a double battle or horde encounter, the player may choose which Pokémon they wish to capture. Basically, what this says is that when you walk into a new area, for instance, you walk into Route 14, congratulations, you're here, you go into a wild battle, oh my god, it's... I don't fucking care, it doesn't matter, I don't even know what the fuck's on Route 14. The point is, whatever that first encounter is, whatever Pokémon that is, that's the only Pokémon you can capture on Route 14. You're not allowed to capture anything else, barring a few exceptional rules that are coming up later. Now, there's a secondary part to Rule 2 that some people follow and some people don't, because of their own personal preferences. And that is that when you capture a Pokémon, you have to nickname it. Like I said, some people don't do it because some people don't like to nickname their Pokémon, some people hate the idea of it. So, you don't have to, which is why it's not a rule in the listing. But, I'm going to be doing it personally, and it's not going to be stupid nicknames like Dickbot or Assface, it's going to be real nicknames, because the idea is that by nicknaming the Pokémon, you are emotionally bonding yourself to it even more. Rule number three. The player is allowed to capture static Pokémon like Snorlax or Sudowoodo, and static legendaries such as Mewtwo and Groudon slash Kyogre, even if they are not the first encounter of an area. Roaming legendaries such as the Dog Trio and Cresselia apply as well, the player being allowed to try capturing them as many times as they encounter them. As in the previous rule, there are no second chances if the player causes the Pokémon to faint. So, this is basically a mercy rule. Um... Because, you know, it, fucking, the Cerulean Cave is a long-ass dungeon. Unless you use repels, there's no chance you're gonna make it to Mewtwo before you don't encounter something else. So basically what this does is it lets you capture legendary Pokémon when you encounter them in their static forms. Same thing with static Pokémon like Snorlax and the like. 
again, it's just a mercy rule. Um, it's one of the ones that people go back and forth on. A lot of people say no to this because, you know, they want to make the game even more difficult than it needs to be for a Nuzlocke run. I included this in my personal rule set because I would like to have some things, you know, just extra Pokemon to have in case of emergency. Rule number four. The player may choose not to capture a Pokemon in slash or the evolutionary stages of a Pokemon they have already captured before, but the player only gets three chances at such in each area, with the third encounter being take it or leave it. The same applies if a wild Pokemon uses an escape attack such as Roar or Whirlwind or Teleport, but again the player is allowed only three chances of such before they must write the area off and move on. So what this means is... Basically, it's what's called the duplicate clause, and or the duplass. And what it means is, for instance, if you capture a Pidgey in Route 1, and you make it to Route 2, and the first thing you encounter is another Pidgey, you can choose to not capture that Pidgey and capture the next Pokemon instead. But if the next Pokemon is also a Pidgey, you can choose to skip it again one more time. If the third Pokemon is also a Pidgey, you have to either take that Pidgey or take nothing. And, uh, the bottom part of that rule is basically because some Pokemon use attacks like Roar, Whirlwind, Teleport, shit to end the battle immediately. It's really cheap when that happens, and it kind of can't be faulted to the player. So, you're allowed three chances of that, too. Rule number five. Mystery gift and trading with other players is not allowed, except to allow the player to evolve their own Pokemon. For those Pokemon who must be holding a certain item during the trade in order to evolve, the item must come from the player's own inventory. The Pokemon must then be traded back to the player immediately. The use or giving of any items by slash from the other player is also not allowed. All in-game trades or gifts from NPC characters, however, are perfectly acceptable. So basically what this one is explaining is, um... I forgot to mention it earlier on the rule about captures. These rules are set up so that you can use them with any version if anybody wants to play by my specific Nuzlocke challenge rules. They're set up for well, pretty much any version of Pokemon except for, you know, Generation 7 Beyond where I don't know what the fuck's gonna happen. For instance, I'm gonna be playing on Fire Red, so there's no such thing as Double Battles or Horde Battles. So they're not applicable, but they're still in here. Likewise, um, you know, you can't Mystery Gift on a Game Boy Advance game. At least not easily. But regardless, this rule sets it up so you're not allowed to mystery gift, which means any event Pokemon that are there you can't have. Um, and you can't trade with other players unless you're going to evolve your own Pokemon. So basically, Haunter, Graveler, Machoke, and Kadabra, and any other Pokemon that require a trade to evolve, you can trade those. But when you do, the other player has to send them back to you immediately. They can't teach them any TMs or HMs. They can't give them any items. They can't make them hold anything. They can't give them PP ups or HP ups or Carbos or Iron or Zinc or anything like that. They cannot do that. It has to go right back to you. And as it also says, if, for instance, you want to evolve your Scyther into a Scizor, it has to be holding a metal coat. It has to be a metal coat that came from your own inventory. You can't uh, trade the Scyther to the other player, they give it a metal coat and then send it back to you and all of a sudden, wow, you have a Scizor. Not allowed. Basically, everything has to be resourced from the player's own everything. And the last part of this rule basically says that all trades are gifts in-game, like the guy who sells you a Magikarp for $500 or whatever. That's still perfectly acceptable. You can do all that because it's in the game, so that's fine. Now, granted, of course, this rule doesn't necessarily apply to me in my run, because I'm going to be doing a randomized playthrough, and there's an option by which I can check so that trade evolutions are null completely, and it's set up to evolve via level like anything else would be. Rule number six. If the player encounters a wild, shiny Pokémon, it may be caught even if it is not the first encounter of the area. This Pokémon is to be considered immortal, and does not have to be placed in the graveyard PC box even if it faints. Immortal Pokémon can be revived only at Pokémon Centers. This is basically another mercy rule people have developed, because the odds of encountering a shiny Pokémon 
are 1 in 8,192. Which means, through 8,000 plus battles, you could never encounter a shiny Pokémon. Speaking, you know, in terms of chance. So it's so rare to encounter a shiny Pokémon, and shinies are so coveted anyways, that if you encounter one, you can catch it even if it's not the first thing you encounter in the area. And because they're so rare, it's basically exempt from the death rule. Basically saying it's, you know, like a god Pokemon, I guess you could say. It's magical, it's mystical, it has crazy powers, and shit doesn't apply to it. Rule number seven. The player is not allowed to escape from battle voluntarily via the run option or the use of fleeing attacks such as roar, whirlwind, teleport, or the use of items. If the player is avoiding capture of a duplicate encounter, the wild Pokémon must still be fought. Fleeing attacks of wild Pokémon do not count against the player, and nor does the uncontrolled use of attacks by the player's own Pokémon through disobedience or metronome. Basically, this is relatively self-explanatory. You're not allowed to run from battle. If you go into battle, you fight to the death. Either you die, or the enemy dies. You can't run, you can't escape, you can't use Smoke Ball or Polka Doll, which allow you to escape from wild battles immediately, and you can't use the fleeing moves that are detailed above. Not specifically just those, anything at all, because I know there's more than just War War I want to teleport that will get you the fuck out of the battle. Basically, though, you can't use any of that, you have to stay in battle. And that applies even if you go into an area and you encounter a duplicate Pokemon as your first encounter, you don't want to catch it, you don't want to deal with that shit, you still have to kill it. And, um, as the second part describes, you know, you can't control the other Pokemon, you can't control your own Pokemon if they disobey you from an in-game trade that was, like, way too high-leveled, or, um, if your Pokemon knows Metronome and it uses one of those attacks, you can't be held accountable for that, so it doesn't count against you. Rule number eight. The player is not allowed to use attacks like Teleport, and Slash, or Dig outside of battle as a shortcut to exit a cave slash dungeon or to the entrance of Pokemon centers. Use of perishable items such as escape ropes and repels, however, remains perfectly acceptable. Basically, this one is saying you can't fast track your way to safety by use of moves like teleport or dig, things like that. Things that are, you know, you can teach your Pokemon basically a move that will get your ass to safety anytime you need it. You can use items though, like escape rope and repel, because to get those, you have to either find them in the wild, or you have to buy them. They're perishable, and they cost the player something. Attacks and moves don't do anything. You can use those as many times as you want. It's a cheap out, so it's not allowed. Rule number nine. If the player black slash whites out, it is considered a game over. Each time the player defeats a gym leader counts as a checkpoint from which to restart in the event of a game over. ROM users may rely on safe states for such, Physical cart users should try to only save their games after beating a gym leader. If a physical cart user has real-life obligations such as school, work, or sleep, then they should simply leave the system closed and charging while they are away. Now, there's a couple of things to this one. Basically what this is saying is that if you run out of usable Pokémon, if all six of your Pokémon faint, then you white out and go back to the Pokémon Center. If you beat the gym leader, though, however, you've gotten to a checkpoint. So, for instance, if if you lose all your Pokémon, if all your Pokémon faint before you make it to Brock, you have to start off from the very beginning of the game. If you beat Brock and you lose all your Pokémon in battle before you fight Misty, you have to go back to fight everything basically after Brock. If, you, if you're using a ROM, you can use save state. Immediately after you beat the gym leader, you can hit save state and you have a place where you can resort back to whenever you fuck up and die completely. So, the next part, though, about physical cart users makes it difficult. Again, I tried to set up these rules so that they apply to anybody who wants to play this of their own accord. So, if you're playing on a physical cart, if you don't have a ROM, that means you don't have save states. If you don't have save states, you should really try to only save after each gym leader battle. But, as it says, I know people have obligations like school and work and sleep and shit. So, what you should try to do is if you need to do any of those things, pause the game, close the system, put it on charge, and do whatever it is you have to do. Hopefully you don't have asshole parents or an asshole roommate who will see your system on and be like, oh, let's turn that off. Hopefully that doesn't happen. If it does, I guess you're fucked. Or are you? Because 
the next rule covers all of that. Rule number 10. In the event of the battery dying or other such reset incidents, the player is allowed three chances to encounter their original capture in each area, the third encounter being taken to leave it regardless of if it was the right Pokémon or not. Also, any Pokémon that faints before the point at which the reset occurred does not have to be released unless it faints twice. Once the player reaches the spot where the reset occurred, all rules are once again in play. This is a mercy rule that directly follows the previous rule. Basically saying, you know, if your battery dies, or if your roommate's an asshole and, like, shuts your console off, or your parents are an asshole and they shut your console off, whatever the case may be. Um, basically from the last time you saved, as long as it was an external force that caused the reset, not, oh, I lost all my Pokemon, I'm gonna LR start select and reset the game, you are given this mercy rule. You're allowed three chances to catch any Pokemon that you caught previously. So if you caught a Mankey in your first time through an area, and the game, the battery died and you're fucked, you're allowed to try catching a Mankey again up to three times. The third Pokemon you run into, though, is take it or leave it, you don't fucking get another chance to catch your Mankey. Same goes if you have a Pokemon that faints, because it's a lot to do with paying attention and being careful, but critical hits are a major part of things, and critical hits aren't always guaranteed. So if you're trying to get back to where you were, and all of a sudden, a random wild Pokemon gets a critical hit on you and kills you, it's a bit unfair. So, you don't release that Pokemon unless it faints again. Rule number 11. If the player has no Pokemon that can learn a specific HM or other field move that is required to progress, the player is allowed to capture a Pokemon that can learn such. However, this Pokemon cannot be used in battle for any reason and must be released as soon as the player captures another Pokemon capable of learning the HM slash field move instead. Really, this one is, again, sort of a... I wouldn't even say a mercy rule, it's sort of a game-breaking prevention rule. Because if you're only capturing the first thing you encounter in each area, there may be a time when, for instance, you don't have any water Pokemon. That's entirely possible that up to a certain point, you wouldn't have any water Pokemon at all. So, what this rule does is prevent people from being stuck permanently. Like, for instance, Fire Red and Red Blue Yellow, basically the Kanto games. To get from Fuchsia City to Cinnabar Island, you have to surf. If you've never caught a water Pokemon up to this point, though, all of a sudden, you don't have a Pokemon that can learn surf. This rule allows you to go out and capture a Pokemon completely outside the rules, that you can teach the HM to, so Surf in this case. Use a good rod, catch a tentacle, and use Surf on that to be able to get to wherever the fuck you need to go. But, you cannot use that Pokemon, so the tentacle you caught specifically for Surf purposes, you can't use it in battle. So, it, at the same time that it makes it easier on you, because, you know, you have a way around being stuck, it fucks you over because it limits you to having five party slots. The last part of this rule, though, covers that problem, in that the next time you naturally capture a Pokemon through the rules that can learn the HM instead, you have to release the Pokemon that you captured to basically be the HM slave. Rule number 12. The Safari Zone is exempt from capture rules and the fleeing rule. However, the player is allowed only one trip into the Safari Zone and allowed only 10 total captures. If the player runs out of time or Safari Balls before such, there is no second chance. In the event that any of such happens before the player finishes a quest linked to a location within the Safari Zone, they are allowed to re-enter and complete the quest, but they are not allowed to capture anything. This rule basically is the Safari Zone rule, because the Safari Zone is a place where you can really only capture certain Pokémon. You can't catch them ever outside of that area, and it's very limited and specific. This is basically another Mercy rule, in that when you enter the Safari Zone for the first time, you are exempt from the normal capture rules and the fleeing rule, which means you can capture more than just the first thing you encounter, and you can run from battles whenever you want. But you're only allowed to capture 10 total Pokémon in the Safari Zone. That's it, just 10. So your first time in the Safari Zone, if you run out of time, or you use all 30 Safari Balls, or however many they give you in whatever version you're playing, usually it's 30, I think. If you run out of time or out of Safari Balls, before you can capture 10 Pokémon, you don't get a second chance. If you only catch two things in the Safari Zone, and you waste 28 balls trying to capture a Kangaskhan and it fucking hates you and will not capture and doesn't run away or whatever, 
you're just fucked. You only get those two Pokemon, you're caught. You don't get another second chance, you don't get anything. Now, in Red, Blue, Yellow, and Fire, Red, and Leaf, Green, there's a quest in the Safari Zone that you have to complete. You have to reach a certain place in the Safari Zone to get an item to progress with the game. So, if you go into the Safari Zone and you capture 10 total Pokemon, or run out of time, or out of Safari Balls, you're allowed to go back in the Safari Zone to finish the quest, but you can't capture anything this time. Rule number 13. The player is only allowed to have two legendary Pokemon in their party at a given time. Legendary Pokemon being defined as any Pokemon that cannot be hatched or used in breeding due to the default programming of the game. This rule is basically there to make things a little bit more difficult and not give the player too much of a massive advantage. So to prevent the player's party from being overpowered, the player is only allowed to have two legendary Pokemon in their party at a given time, exactly as it says. There's a lot of stupid debate about what counts as legendary Pokemon and what doesn't. The definition that most people go by, basically, as it says, legendary in this case is defined as any Pokemon that can't be used in breeding. So, you know, just be smart. If it's a one-off legendary Pokemon, you can't fucking use more than two of them, okay? Special rule for randomized playthroughs. Along with the first encounter capture of a given area, the player is also allowed to capture one randomly generated legendary Pokemon in each area. However, the player is only allowed to capture two of each legendary Pokemon from such random encounters, and thus is only allowed to capture three of any given legendary if the third encounter is static. Does not apply towards shinies. This rule is specific for those people using a randomized ROM, which is what I'll be doing, hence why this rule exists. It's really another mercy rule with a bit of a limitation on it. So, basically, along with the first capture, if I go in Route 1 and capture fucking, let's just say, a star you, because it's randomized and shit can happen, then that's what I have. Congratulations, whoop you fucking do Let's say my next encounter, though, is Articuno. I'm allowed to capture that Articuno, but if the encounter after Articuno is Mewtwo, I can't fucking capture it. Basically, it's the second rule, the capture rule, all over again, only with legendary stipulation. And the same applies in the sense of, as what I just said, the first encounter, the first legendary encounter Ruby one could be Articuno. So if I kill that Articuno, then my legendary capture for Route 1 is also shot. If I encounter Mewtwo in the next battle, I can't catch it because it's still following the same capture rule. It just has legendary specific to their own category. This rule is further constrained by the fact that you can only capture two of each legendary Pokemon through random encounters. So if in Route 3 you encounter Mewtwo and you catch it, and then in Route 13 you capture Mewtwo and catch it, you cannot capture another Mewtwo until you find Mewtwo in a static encounter somewhere in the game. Be it in Celadon Cave, or be it in some other place because the randomized ROM put him in the place of, say, Zapdos. Basically, you're only allowed to have three of each legendary Pokémon. Two of those legendary Pokémon you can encounter through random battles. The third one has to be static. The last part that says does not apply towards Shinies is pretty much an extension of the Shiny rule, which is that you're allowed to capture a shiny Pokemon when it shows up no matter what the fuck else happens. Alright, now that I've explained the rules, I'm going to go through the process of randomizing the ROM with this you see here. The randomizer that I'm using is the Universal Pokemon Randomizer, as seen here and here, made by Stew. so credit to that guy. That can leave now, I don't need that anymore. Oh, there's the taskbar that's not going away because it's an asshole. Alright, so basically this is a Java file that Debomstu made, and what you do with it is, well, you randomize the ROM, which I'm going to show you now. So you go to Open ROM, we're going to go for our Fire Red ROM, you see it loads, and now we have options available. So let's start up here. Update type effectiveness is only applicable to Red, Blue, and Yellow. So we're going to update the moves. What this does, as you can see through the pop-up menus, or the pop-up descriptions, is... It's not gonna fuck it It makes everything updated to its Gen 5 stats. So, for instance, the HM Fly... I don't even know how much damage it did before, but as of 
the Generation 5 games, which was Black and White and Black 2 and White 2, it has 90 attack, 90 power. So it updates all the moves to be current, basically. So we're going to mark that, because why not? We're going to remove trade evolutions, and what this does is exactly what it says. It uh, takes the trade evolutions, so for instance, Machoke to Machamp, or Haunter to Gengar, and it turns them into a level-based evolution so that you don't need to trade to get them. And um, it also sets it so that anything that requires a trade with an item, so for instance, Scyther to Scizor, um, instead of having to trade with an item, it just changes it to a stone evolution, so I would guess for Scyther to Scizor, you'd have to use the Leaf Stone. I don't... I don't know. But we're marking that because, you know, there's no outside interaction. Lowercase Pokemon names don't care. Now, since we're playing on Fire Red and Leaf Green, we have to give ourselves the National Dex. You... Basically, it's not really necessary, but without the National Dex, if I find a Pokemon that's not part of the base Dex, which... It's Fire Red, Leaf Green, so I assume it's the Kanto Pokedex. So if I, for instance, get a Togepi out of nowhere, the Togepi can never, ever, ever evolve into Togekiss if I don't have the National Dex. So that's on. All this stuff doesn't matter because it's basically just for races with friends, so basically, like, you could have two- you could make this ROM, then copy it, and then give it to somebody else, the two of you could race so you could finish first. That's not what we're doing, though, so none of that's important. Now we move on to the area down here. So, base statistics are gonna remain as they are, because we don't want that shit changed. Because the last thing we need, in a Nuzlocke run especially, is... Every time the phone fucking rings. The last thing we need in a Nuzlocke run is a random wild Pokemon that has the same base stats as Mewtwo. That could just destroy everything. It's bad enough that Mewtwo himself could pop up in the grass, so we're not gonna change stats at all. And we're not gonna change abilities either because that could lead to all kinds of insanity that we don't wanna deal with. Now we're gonna change our starter Pokemon though. We're going to change it to random basic Pokemon with two evolutions. Which, as this thing says, will set it up to where the three starter Pokemon will be random, as in they won't be Bulbasaur, Charmander, or Squirtle. But it will be, I, well, I guess you could say, it has a very good chance of not being Bulbasaur, Charmander, or Squirtle. There's still a chance that one of them, or even all three of them, could randomly still be there. But, basically what it does is it shovels it around so that the starter Pokémon will be three random Pokémon with three evolutions. So, theoretically, when I start this, my three starter choices could be... I don't know, let's say Ghastly, Slackoth, and Nuzleaf. So, Pokémon types, they're going to remain unchanged because... Also, this thing, if you use the scroll wheel, this is what happens, so we're gonna try not to do that, but I'm pretty sure I'm going to repeatedly. Pokemon types are going to remain unchanged because what this would do is randomize the types. So we could end up with a Charizard that is water and grass at the same time. And um, if you mark it as random completely, it doesn't even follow evolutions. If you mark it as follow evolutions, then Charmeleon would have been water and grass as well. If you mark it completely random, Charmeleon could have been poison and flying. So it basically... It's, it, this thing is a randomizer, that's what it does, is it randomizes the fuck out of everything. But we're leaving that unchanged. So, now we're gonna go to the move sets. We're going to go random preferring same type. What that means is basically all the Pokemon are going to have move sets that are not... Well, they could be their original move sets because it's random, but odds are it's going to be just ridiculous out there crazy. So we could have a Pikachu that, for instance, knows... I don't know an electric move that Pikachu can't normally learn. Something, something, something. Okay, moving along from that, then we'll just say instead we could capture Moltres and have it learn Fire Punch. Moltres doesn't have arms, so it can't punch, so normally it wouldn't learn that move, but with this, it could. The moves will prefer to be the same type as the Pokemon, that way things will be more or less still balanced. We could have set it for completely random, which means we could have a Charizard that knows Hydro Pump. Or we could put it to metronome only mode, which fuck that, because then everything in the game only knows metronome. And the last thing you want in Nuzlocke runs is the remote chance, even, of having self-destruct. So, 
yeah, we're going to keep it as that. I feel like I want to go to Unchanged, but, you know, that should keep it more interesting and fun. So, Trainer Pokemon. Now, here's where things are going to get a little bit more interesting for the first time in this. We're going to set it to type-themed, which means that all the trainers will have type-themed Pokemon as they should, but we could run into a hiker who, instead of using, you know, fighting or ground or rock Pokemon, the hiker could use all water Pokemon or all grass Pokemon. So we're going to keep that, though, and also what this will do is set it so that the gyms are completely changed in type. I could go to fight Brock, and Brock could be, mysteriously now, the dark Pokemon trainer. So we'll make it so the rival carries the starter through the game. We don't want him to change it repeatedly. Um, all of them will try to keep Pokemon of the same strength to their original Pokemon they would have had. So if a hiker has a Machop, then it will give him something that is equivalent to a strength of Machop. Um, that just makes things happen and stuff, and I don't know exactly. Do we want the trainers to use legendaries? Now, here's the thing, alright? I could mark this right now so that no trainers have legendaries, but where would the fun be in that? How exciting will it be, or how miserable will I be, if I'm out in the middle of nowhere, I desperately need to make it to a Pokemon Center, I cross a trainer who has a Mewtwo and an Articuno. It's going to be fun, trust me. I'm going to hate it later. I'm going to hate myself for this. And we're going to mark this for no early Shedinja, because Shedinja is a major, major problem in that its ability is Wonder Guard. Shedinja only have one HP. They never ever, their HP never changes. It's always one. But they have an ability called Wonder Guard, which only allows super effective moves to hit them. Which Shedinja, if I recall correctly, is Bug and Flying. I know it's bug for sure, so fire attacks will do it. But what if I don't have a fire type Pokemon? I'm a little bit fucked. Now, if I go up here, I think I can... Yes, if I randomize the abilities, I can check that... Uh, or I can leave it unchecked, rather, and have it so that no Pokemon will ever have Wonder Guard. But then I run the risk of everything else being crazy anyways. So we're not going to go with all that. Now, wild Pokemon. Here's where it gets interesting... Interesting... Here's where it gets interesting all over again. We're gonna mark this as random. Completely the fuck random. So, what that means is, in Route 1, just outside Pallet Town, I could very well run into Star Use. Or I could very well run into, I don't know, Rhyhorns. So, we're gonna keep that as random completely because that's gonna add some entertainment and fun. And we're gonna set a minimum catch rate. That just makes it easier to catch Pokemon that are below a catch rate of, I believe it was 45? Yes. So, what that means is legendary Pokemon start off with a base capture value of, I want to say it's three. Right now I'm getting really nerdy. If you don't know this stuff, you're probably like, what the fuck are you talking about? Basically, legendary Pokemon are hard as hell to catch. Everybody knows that. This will set it so that every Pokemon with a capture rate below 45, which is legendaries, etc., 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 We'll have at least a capture rate of 45. That just makes it a little bit easier for me to catch stuff. So, this is basically in place specifically for the legendaries in the wild. Because we're bound to encounter them. But, it doesn't really matter necessarily, because I can only capture two of each legendary as per the rules preset that we've already gone through. Moving on! So now we're going to change the static Pokémon. We've also reached the bottom of this thing, so we're almost done. The static Pokemon will be changed to random legendary swap for legendary and normal swap for normal. Which means, basically, all the legendary Pokemon, let's just start with those, all the static Pokemon, so Pokemon that you are guaranteed to find, like their sprites are in the environment, like Zapdos is in the power plant, Moltres is in Victory Road, etc, etc. Those will still be there, the sprites will still be there, but the Pokemon will be swapped around. So, when I go to the power plant and approach Zapdos, when the battle starts, I could find myself fighting, let's just say, Groudon. And when I go to fight Mewtwo, I could find myself fighting Deoxys. So basically, it just shuffles them around. Normal Pokemon, it does the same thing for static normal legend- or blah, blah, blah. Static normal encounters. So for instance, when I approach a Snorlax, I could, you know, go into a battle with pretty much anything that's not a legendary Pokemon. So I go to a Snorlax, and I could encounter all of a sudden, oh my god, look, it's... I don't know, Ludicolo, because that's supposed to be the only one. I can't talk today. 
So TMs and HMs, they're going to remain unchanged. Because that's just, you know... We're going to get rid of that. We don't want to change them around. TMs and HMs probably should stay preset. So, basically that means if I find... I don't know. I don't know, actually. Well, let's just go with Hyper Beam. Because you can buy TM15 Hyper Beam in the Celadon store. The department store. So... You know, if I ever want Hyper Beam, I know I can go get Hyper Beam. The Move Tutors will change them to complete random and random preferring same type. So, the Move Tutors in the game, like, I know there's one spot where these, these two guys, one of them will teach you Mega Punch, the other one will teach you Mega Kick. Basically, what I've done just now is I've changed all of that so that there's no telling what the fuck they're going to teach me. And the moves will be teachable to a random set of Pokemon preferring the same type. So those two guys, one of them could want to teach me, let's just say, Flamethrower, and the other one could want to teach me... I don't know... False Swipe. And those two attacks will be randomized based on what Pokémon can learn them. For instance, Charizard can, can learn Fire, or Flamethrower, blah 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 blah. Jesus. Charizard can learn Flamethrower, and Arcanine can learn Flamethrower. But, with the random prefer same type, while they both could learn it naturally, there's still a chance that they won't be able to because it's randomized. Alright, in-game trades, we're going to randomize the given Pokemon only. We're going to randomize their nicknames. And we're going to randomize their IVs and their items. Now what this does is it changes every trade in the game. So, like for instance in, I want to say, Vermilion, there is a guy in one of the houses that will trade... Uh, it will give you a Farfetch'd for a Spearow, if I remember correctly. That changes it, so he'll still take a Spearow from you, but he'll give you something random in return. You don't know what it is until you do it. So, that's going to be entertaining. And with this, it will have a randomized nickname, randomized IVs. Oh my god, I can't really thank you. And it will be given a randomized item. So, that's going to add a whole other level of entertainment, assuming I can remember where the hell those traits are. And the last thing we're going to do is we're going to randomize the field items. Which means everything in the field can be anything. Like if I find a Pokeball in Mountain Moon, I can pick it up and all of a sudden I have a Master Ball I can use. So basically it just makes everything crazy and random even more. So now we're through with all this. And you know what, actually let's go ahead and mark this too. We're going to randomize all held items. Which means if I find a Pokemon in the wild that normally should be holding, I don't know, let's just say a random berry, it could be holding anything. So basically, once again, what we've done is we've just took, taken everything and made it insane and crazy and swapped around. I still can't talk today. This is going to be a whole shamble of the video, but whatever, doesn't fucking matter. Now, everything is done, so we're going to randomize and save the ROM. We're going to go up so that we're in our ROM folder, and we're going to call this... Randomized Fire Red. We're going to save it. Now it's going to give us an option right here to save a log file, which will save a text document that tells us all the changes that were made. And of course it says right here, this may allow you to gain an unfair advantage. Because it's going to tell you everything that's changed. So if I click yes, it will give me a text document that will tell me like what my three starter choices are, what Pokemon I can encounter in what areas of the random grass, wild lands of Pokemon. Basically, it's a cheat sheet. But, why? Why? Why are we going to do that? Why would we do that? This is all about, you know, jumping into the unknown and fucking doing something really stupid that I'm going to regret. So, fuck it. No. And here it just gives you the, the seed and the strings and blah, 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 blah. You can copy all those if you wanted to and give them to somebody else, and they'll end up with the same things you just ended up with. Anyways, though, so now we exit this. By the way, there's my desktop. I will maintain anarchy. Yes, it's Switch Place Pokemon. So, now we're back here. Here's our randomized Fire Red ROM. We don't know what's going to come from it. We don't know what to expect out of it. You see, there's no log file that tells us what the fuck it is. So, it's done. Basically, all we need to do now is start the emulator and play, which will be episode one, which will be, you know, coming out at some fucking point. So look forward to that. I will see you all then. 
I'm going to be just as surprised as you whenever it comes time to figure out what Pokemon that I'm going to start with, what Pokemon I encounter in the wild first. It's all going to be crazy. No one knows what's going to happen. You don't know. I don't know. The walls don't know. Fucking Kat Von D doesn't know because that's the first random person I could think of. Tony Stark doesn't know. It's, it's crazy. It's random. Okay. <laughs>